Hello there, six o'clock, I'm Michelle Dubry. Coming up tonight, 1930s Britain. Is that what we're living in? Well, according to Saint Gary Lineker, apparently so. What do you make to him, by the way? Is it time that he gets the boot uh, from the BBC for expressing one too many opinions, which quite frankly, are nowhere near being impartial? Childcare, is it time that everyone gets free access to it to get more women into work? It is, after all, International Women's Day. Do you care about that? I've got to be honest, I don't really. Uh, anyway, Anyway, energy, should it be nationalised, yes or no? And uh, Marlene uh, Gersey, whatever the latest name is, uh, that story has not gone away. Apparently, sorry is not good enough. Really? Give me your thoughts on all of the above. But first, let's bring ourselves up to speed with tonight's latest headlines with Polly Middlehurst. Michelle, thanks very much indeed. Well, the top story on GB News tonight, the Prime Minister has accused the Labour leader of being on the side of the people smugglers as the pair went head-to-head -head in the House of Commons over the new illegal migration bill today. Rishi Sunak defended the legislation, which will remove those who enter the UK illegally and ban them from seeking asylum. Sir Keir Starmer cast doubt on the plan, saying attempts to tackle the number of channel crossings in the last decade have failed and the numbers have gone up. He says the Conservatives have lost control of UK borders, which Mr Sunak countered, accusing the opposition of supporting unlimited asylum. The honourable gentleman has been on the wrong side of this issue his entire career. He, descri he described all immigration law as racist. He said it was a mistake to control immigration. And he has never, ever voted for tougher asylum laws. It is clear, Mr Speaker, while he's in hock to the open border activists, we're on the side of the British people. Mr Speaker, when I was in charge of prosecutions, I extradited countless rapists... Convic the conviction rate for people smuggling was twice what it is today. I voted against his legislation last time because I said it wouldn't work. Since it became law, the numbers have gone up. He's proved me right. Well, the former Home Secretary Priti Patel says the migration bill still requires some work. The legislation has only just been published. It's got to go through Parliament. We all want this to work. I think it's important to recognise that obviously it builds upon the previous work that's been put in place. But we do have legislation that only came in this year. It still needs to be implemented. And there's a very, very important message there. Implement what we've got and build upon that going forward. And, you know, look at the work that was done through the new plan for immigration. There's no one single solution to this at all. This needs end-to-end -end reform. Pretty Patel. Now, in other news today, the reward for information about the shooting of a police officer in Northern Ireland last month has been increased to £150,000. Detective Chief Inspector John Caldwell was shot up to ten times at a sports centre in Oma after coaching his children's football match. He remains in a critical but stable condition in hospital. Detective Chief Inspector Eamon Corrigan says he believes two Ford Fiestas were used in the attempted murder. A second Ford Fiesta vehicle was used in the attempted murder of DCI Caldwell. It is also a blue Ford Fiesta of a similar model. The second car had the registration number RLZ9805 and was bought in the Glengormley area of Belfast towards the end of January. I believe this car travelled to Belfast around this time. The Duke of Sussex will be at the centre of a High Court trial against Mirror Group newspapers over phone hacking allegations. And he's one of several high-profile celebrities bringing action against the publisher. The tabloid newspaper is contesting the claims, arguing that some have been brought too late. The trial, though, will begin on the 9th of May and last for around seven weeks. RMT union members will vote tomorrow on a new pay offer from Network Rail aimed at resolving a long-running dispute over pay, jobs and conditions. Union members yesterday suspended the industrial action, which was due to take place on the 16th and 17th of March. The union says the new pay offer involves extra money, but they say industrial action with 14 other rail companies will still go ahead later this month. 
And dozens of flights have been disrupted in the south of England as snow continues to fall across the country. And that's after the coldest night of the year so far. The Met Office saying temperatures dropped to minus 15.4 degrees in the Scottish Highlands overnight. That's the lowest March temperature in more than a decade. And National Highways is warning drivers in the West Midlands and the east of England not to travel unless their journey is absolutely essential. And what's on the way? Well, more sleet, snow and sub-zero temperatures expected across all four UK nations until at least Friday. And lastly, the Princess of Wales has given first aid to a wounded soldier as part of a military exercise on Salisbury Plain. Kate's also received demining training and viewed the weapons used by 1st Battalion Irish Guards. This was the Royal's first visit to the troops since receiving her honorary appointment as Royal Colonel last year. That's all from me for now. I'm back in an hour. Now, Michelle Dubry. Thanks for that, Polly. Well, I am Michelle Dubry and I am keeping you company right through until 7 o'clock this evening alongside me. I've got the commentator, uh, Joe Phillips, and the political consultant, Alex Dean. Good evening Good to evening. both of you. Uh, you know the drill as well, don't you, on Jubes & Co. It's not just about us three. It is very much about you at home tonight. What's on your mind on this International Women's Day? Um, I'm not one, actually, who goes around in pink and high-fiving myself today. Um, does International Women's Day mean anything to you? I wonder, by the way, how much longer this day will even exist. Because if some people had their way, the word woman wouldn't exist, would it? Anyway, Joe, <laughs> do you care? Do you celebrate yourself no, today? No, I don't. And I'm afraid it's like so many things. It's been high hijacked by corporates and ridiculous marketing campaigns. I think in the beginning, um, it was it was quite a good idea and it does allow or suggest that, you know, you can focus on it and certainly in schools and, and places like that, it's been quite useful, but I think its time has probably yeah. come. I disagree for the reasons that you said, uh, Michelle. I, I used to share your cynicism about, about it uh, and the way it's been used, but now when, you, certainly in America, people are accused uh, of asking an offensive question Question if they say, can you say what a woman is? Um, it seems to me there is use in having an International Women's Day and saying that a woman is an, you know, an adult human female, and that's a useful thing to, to reinforce. Why don't we call it adult, International Adult Human Female Day then, so that it can't get hijacked and everyone is absolutely clear <laughs> on that? It doesn't have the same ring to it though, does it? I'll be honest on that one. Uh, right. Gary Lineker, St. Gary Lineker, uh, according to some, he seems to think he is anyway. He is in trouble again today. Uh, this is, of course, about Rishi Sunak's asylum policy that was announced yesterday. Uh, as he frequently does, by the way, he's been sending tweets out on this subject. Uh, I shall try and bring it up to you, uh, if I may, on the screen. But what he was basically saying is there is no huge influx. We take far fewer refugees uh, than any other major European countries. This is just an immeasurably cruel policy directed at the most vulnerable people in language that is not dissimilar to that used by Germany in the 30s. Uh, Alex, you are a passionate historian. I do a podcast on the subject. You've written a book about it. Before we delve into this, can you just give my viewers just a, a flavour uh, of some of the kind of uh, pieces of 1930s Germany that Gary is perhaps suggesting that we are similar to at the moment? Sure, with the caveat that I'm at that most English of things, the amateur enthusiast rather than a, a professional historian. That's the best historian. type. Well, <laughs> well quite. Uh, passionate is the word I use. Passionate, I indeed. Um, the 1930s in Germany gave birth to the Nazis uh, and therefore to the World War and the Holocaust that they promulgated. It was a time of the advance of theories of racial purity, whereas, of course, in the United Kingdom, we live in a multicultural society in which, for example, we have the most diverse cabinet right now that we've ever had. It was a time of increased marginalisation of minorities, from the Roma gypsies to uh, homosexuals to the Jews, uh, most especially, uh, when we have, of course, racial discrimination laws that are uh, robust, and it would be um, career-ending if uh, an accusation of racism was upheld against uh, anyone in uh, public life. So, to me, it seems the comparison is, at, at its most generously interpreted, inapt. Inapt. Jo, your thoughts? I think Gary Lineker is a fantastic football pundit and a great commentator, and he was a really good football player. I think the fact that he presents a football programme 
and was given sanction by the BBC to present the World Cup coverage from Qatar and allowed to talk about the human rights issues around Qatar and the fact that that was such a controversial World Cup um, event. Um, if he was a news presenter, I think it would be a different matter altogether. I mean, here we are on a station that apparently promotes and lords free speech. He's speaking in a personal capacity. He's not speaking on match of the day. But is, he's inextricably indexed uh, to the, uh, I almost said to GB News, but to BBC. <laughs> See, you can tell where my loyalty is like, can't you? But it is inextricably indexed, very high profile. So many people, um, and this has been one of the criticisms before when he's said and done stuff, that actually the impartiality is different for non-news people at the BBC, but there is a slight blurring of the line because of his profile and because of the association. Well, I would argue that he's inextricably linked to football. Um, and I don't think he is using his platform, as I say, on the on the BBC. He's using his platform on a personal capacity. You know, whether or not you agree with him, I think there are some real issues. And actually, I was very interested to see the clip of Priti Patel that just there in the news when she's talking about, you know, we need to implement what's there already. I think that tells you quite a lot about, you know, whether the government has got a plan that whatever your feelings about it, is even practical or workable. So, on the Lineker issue, whilst I understand your position, you regard them as separate, that's not how the BBC interprets it, because it can't have been clearer when he was disciplined last year for breaching the guidelines for what he'd said on Twitter about Conservative Party's alleged Russian don donations and returning money to the Russian donors. They made it clear, one, that the guidance does apply to Lineker. Whether, whether or not you think he, should, he shouldn't, because he's a sports presenter, they made it clear that the guidance does apply to him and that he breached them with party political uh, positions. Uh, so, they made it clear that their presenters should should not uh, indulge in party political issues and debates and that they should avoid political controversies and that your personal accounts, uh, whether you regard them as personal or not, are inextricably linked to your position as a BBC presenter. The big, so he he's couldn't have been more fairly warned by them last year. And that, of course, in turn is a debate that goes back to the post-Brexit period when he was told that he shouldn't be tweeting about Brexit the way he was. And Jonathan Agnew, public, the cricket commentator, mm -hmm. publicly tweeted, you should stick to the, to the um, guidelines and if I did what you did, I, I would be fired. The biggest, I feel, it's very seldom I feel sorry for a director general, but I feel really sorry for the headache he's got here because, you know, Gary Lineker in many ways, for the reasons you've described, is an asset to the corporation. But the trouble is, if they can't enforce the guidelines, having already told him they apply to him, if they can't enforce the guidelines on their one of their most high-profile people, and certainly their most highly paid person, then presumably the guidelines don't really apply to anybody. No, well, and I, shall we move on from uh, St Lineker? Teflon Lineker, uh, who's blocked me, by the way. He blocked me on Twitter, uh, which did make me chuckle. Anyway, let's move on from him a little bit and let's broaden this out into this whole kind of concept because one of my viewers has just got in touch and said, uh, the, the, you know, the focus here shouldn't be... Uh, here we go, Graham. Uh, his comments are not problematic because of his uh, links to the BBC, but simply because they are offensive. And this whole notion, this um, smear, if you like, of... Uh, far right, Nazi, all the rest, it's become so commonplace now when basically what you mean is, I just don't like what you're doing, I disagree with but, you. And, and, and that works in both sides of the argument. I mean, you know, we've now got Suella Braverman having to say, I didn't sign off the letter that went out to Tory supporters and MPs in her name and signed by her where she referred to the blob of lawyers civil servants and Labour. So, in one fell the swoop, blog. she's, yeah, she's attacked civil servants. She's now had to double back, double down and apologise on it. Now, she says she didn't see that, she didn't sign it off. Well, you know, she's the Home Secretary and she's been in problems like this before. Uh, the trouble is with this debate, and, you know, we've had this discussion before, Michelle, it is so... It is so emotionally um, fraught that whatever your side you're on, the other side is always going to say either you're, you know, a bleeding heart liberal who will open the doors to everybody or you're a right-wing Nazi. Joe, that's, Nazi. Not, that's not true, because that's not how you speak to me and it's not how I speak no, to I you. No, I know. And one should be able to still be yeah, should, civil. You should hear what she says about you behind your back. Well, I know, at least in my face. But we, we, we should no, be able to be are, civil about these but things. But that's good, and I, and I agree with it. But the problem is that when you get into this mudslinging that becomes so offensive to so many people, you lose sight of the real issues. And the real issue is, actually, can this work? I don't think there's anybody 
who thinks it would be a good idea to let these boats keep coming across the channel with people risking their lives, people making absolute shed loads of money yeah. and ripping people off and pushing them out. You know, I mean, it's bitterly cold out there. I live in Kent. We've done a programme down we there. We did. Um, you know, if anybody is travelling in these conditions with children and insufficient safety gear, they're desperate. But the people who yeah, are... Yeah, come on, no, they're no, mainly no, no. guys. You do we Well, some that. are and some aren't, but my point no, is that... they're mainly guys. But the... They are, you can't see that, aren't they? The children and women are few and far well, between. there are some. There yeah, are But they some. are mainly guys, aren't they? But, you know, some of them may Why have... Why won't you concede that they're mainly men? They are mainly men, but Good, s okay. but that doesn't mean to say that they are mainly, um, you know, people that don't have a, a right to claim asylum. I think the problem is that we've got, you know, nobody wants that to carry on because of the risk to life and limb and the fact that the, you know, the, the criminal gangs are making a fortune out of it and making a fortune. We have given millions to France mm. over the last um, goodness knows how many years. I think this has been ill thought through by the government. France, it, um, Richie Sunak's meeting President Macron on Friday for the first bilateral summit since he became Prime Minister. There is obviously a much better, a more cordial relationship between Britain and France since he became Prime Minister. It would have been sensible to have that conversation, but we've poured millions into France with nothing happening. Nothing's happened with Rwanda, and we've still got a backlog. And then here we are, the but policy of last resort. I just want to have a go at answering the question that you asked Joe about whether the rhetoric is helpful. And my answer is no, it's definitely not helpful to have rhetoric um, like this, because we should always be able to agree uh, to disagree, and we should always be able to uh, conduct our discussions civilly, even or especially when the topics are passionately held. And I passionately want to stop the uh, boats coming over the channel for the reasons that Joe accurately describes. Uh, and I therefore find myself largely supporting the government, as it happens, in, in a dis debate about public policy, a position for which, courtesy uh, of someone we've already been discussing, I and others who hold my view, have been wildly slurred and called Nazis and so forth online uh, today, because someone with 8 million views went out and said, made this comparison with the 1930s. And therefore, people who are so tolerant, regard themselves as being so tolerant that they simply cannot tolerate another point of view being aired, uh, feel completely liberated to call other people anything they like under the sun. And I just think that's deeply unhelpful. It's very true. In Denmark, uh, they have what people refer to as a jewellery law. And what that means is that when people uh, go into their country, they take or they have uh, the opportunity to take items, jewellery, etc., from these people uh, by way of almost payment for their processing fees. I have to say, that makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. That kind of thing makes me uh, think of 1930s Germany and Nazi Sewing Germany. diamonds into the coats and so forth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just, I feel uh, that kind of thing is uh, Well, and not, I, and I dare say the people who've, you know, they've probably sold all their jewellery or, or given it to the, the people smugglers who are yeah. pushing them off. Some of the worst criminals in the world. Yeah. yeah, and I was, because I was looking into uh, today other countries and what they're doing. And actually, uh, when you look at other countries that are members of uh, the ECA, HR, you know, they seem to be pushing boundaries a lot more than uh, the UK, with a response yeah. to it but, being minimal. But the, the trouble is, and I think this may be where Joe and I do disagree, the trouble is that when people say that, um, well, international law says that you don't have to apply to the first safe nation you go to and, and so forth, they are right. Right? So the government is in a, a tricky position and the government shouldn't, in my view, bind itself to saying we'll definitely be uh, following our obligations under the ECHR. Because in my view, what people coming across an entire safe continent uh, of countries in which they could have applied for asylum in order to come to the UK and that being OK under the system makes a mockery of international law. And if we can't tweak it and if we can't change it, and if we can't have a new system that complies with it, then we should keep the option open of leaving the ECHR. Yeah, but, and... But Sorry. It's America as well. Um, there's so many places because we was having this debate last night and people were saying, oh, it's the UK and it, the UK is like filled with all these awful people that are trying to kind of restrict all of these poor, innocent souls. But actually, when you look globally now, so many different countries are sitting and looking at how do we strengthen our borders? How do we tighten our borders? And how do you actually keep your internal citizens safe? Because actually, when you let a load of people in who, quite frankly, you don't know who they are, uh, you're risking things. Well, yes, and it, it is more difficult if, if you are a small island with a very small, narrow crossing between the largest continent and your near neighbour. But, you know, in some ways, you would think, actually, because we're a small island, it would have been easier 
to do this properly, there needs to be a much better root and branch reform and everything so far has failed and I think this will too. You uh, guys divided at home, Peter says, Jubes, Gary Lineker has the same right as everybody to express his opinion, providing they are not expressed while presenting a sports programme for the BBC. Even though, Peter says, I don't agree with him. Karen says, Lineker should have been sacked a very long time ago. We pay his wages, so he should basically shut up. Uh, and that is reflected throughout my uh, inbox, I have to say, lots of division. Um, typical champagne lefty who lives in a beautiful home away from problems. He should stick to playing with his balls. Right, uh, I get what you... Yes. Uh, l OK, if Lineker is not guilty, uh, then surely Matt Hancock is innocent. His tweets and emails, etc., were private and his own thoughts, so they are innocent. You're, yeah, obviously talking about Matt Hancock there and the leaks that we've seen, the so-called lockdown files. Uh, Jeremy Clarkson says Stuart has lost his contract for writing personal views on Meghan Markle. Uh, surely the same should apply to Lineker. Yeah, but uh, Jeremy Clarkson wasn't uh, employed by the BBC, of course. Uh, Lineker is. Uh, keep your thoughts coming in. GBviews at gbnews.uk is how you can reach me tonight. Twitter, if that's your thing, you can get me on there too. Now, do you have kids? Um, if not, do you think you should help fund the childcare for everybody else? Is Bernard, one of my viewers, is straight off the mark. He's been in touch saying absolutely not. I'm asking you, is it time for free childcare for all? Give me your thoughts and I'll see you in two. We are GB News, the people's channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. Please. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess that I've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Co. Right, you're uh, an inspiration to us all. Click that bit up. Well, you are. You, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are, <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. <laughs> Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us. GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubri, weekday evenings at 6 o'clock. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel.
Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company till seven alongside me, Joe Phillips, the political commentator and the political consultant, Alex Dean. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Peter, my viewer, says, Michelle, if you cannot afford a child, then you should not breed. You should not expect others to pay for your ignorance. No free childcare. That's Peter, not mixing, not mincing his words there. Uh, I lead with that because it is International Women's Day and we're talking about working mums. Uh, get this, though. Uh, a survey showing that two-thirds of UK women said that childcare duties are affecting their career progression. Now, uh, there's been so many kind of reports, consultations, rally cries from everyone, really, on different sides of the fence that childcare in this country is too expensive, it prohibits we, uh, women from going back to work, and something should be done about it. One proposal uh, is that actually free childcare for all all parents, you have your child in nursery with a go for free. Would you support that, Jo? Well, I think, you know, nobody likes, or it's always said a means-tested benefit is a mean benefit. Um, and there would be people who would say, actually, that's ridiculous. There are plenty of people who could afford it. And it's a bit of the old argument about family allowance. Rich people use it for their sort of Chardonnay fund, while poor people use it to, to struggle to make ends meet. But actually, you know, the loss to the economy of working predominantly women, it's not always women, but working parents, is huge. Um, £90 billion pounds of, of uh, gross value added to the economy every year. And you've got people who are unable to work um, or who can't work the hours. P you know, there's, there's various points on this. People who are working but are claiming universal credit, the, because of the cap on the childcare support element of that benefit, in-work benefit, it actually means that someone on a minimum wage, it's uneconomical for them to work more than 26 hours outside of London and more than 20 hours in London because mm. of the cost of childcare. So that's actually stopping people that we need to get back to work to boost the economy. So I think, you know, it is one of the things... Actually, it's one of the few things that Liz Truss was quite good at campaigning about when mm. she was briefly Prime Minister. Um, but I think, you know... All 44 days of it, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, this is a survey from the British Chambers of Commerce. They represent all sorts of businesses. Um, and I think it is fair to say, from what they've said, that there needs to be more support. It doesn't necessarily have to be financial support, but it's about flexible working. Mm, um, they do make me laugh, though, some of these companies. They conduct all these surveys telling the state, actually, that they should pay more for childcare. And actually, when you look at some of these huge organisations, I'm thinking of one that I was involved with uh, not that long ago. You've got your hairdressers on site, your post office, your supermarkets, your everythings, but no on-site crash. So actually, a lot of these businesses could practise what they preach and they could make facilities mm -hmm. available for their staff if indeed they were that bothered. Uh, Alex? We have amongst the most uh, expensive childcare in uh, the developed world, uh, and, and not just by a bit, but by a lot. And so my view on this is, is somewhat akin to um, the discussion about um, supporting higher education. Not everyone goes into higher education, just as not everyone has children. I don't have any, any children. But I'm completely open to the notion that all of us should do something to support those who do. After all, they produce the next generation who are going on to become the next uh, people in, in Britain. And, uh, and hopefully they'll support us in our old age, even if it's not us directly, they'll support us by working whilst we are pensioners. So there is a self-interest in this as much as anything else. Um, but I also agree with the points Joe was making about this stymieing an otherwise potentially very economically productive part of the population, which is women who want to go back to the workplace but find that they can't. And very often, if they can get over the hurdle of getting back in the first place and their career uh, it, it, it continues as it would have done had they not had uh, children or without the big gap that they wind up having, then they go on to more senior positions and higher earnings and pay more tax. So the state has a big self-interest in it too. But the reason I make the comparison with um, higher education is that just as with uh, people who go on to do a degree, I believe that we commonly should contribute something to support it. I don't believe in, in making childcare free for everybody, but I do believe in making it just that bit easier. And I, you know, people don't want everything on a plate. People accept the responsibility of parenthood as one of the great missions in life, right? And they don't expect everything to be completely easy. But if we can help them a little bit, I think we should. And the state doing just something on it, I think, would go a long way. You guys at home, um, I'm going to be quite blunt, you're quite a harsh bunch. Um, Philip says, Michelle, 
free childcare, free meals, family allowance, etc. Perhaps the government should just take the child straight from the maternity ward and bring it up themselves. Can I just say something on that then? Because there is also a free market point on this, which also strangles the, the provision of childcare, not by the state, but in the private sector. Because our requirements on childcare providers, whether it be the qualifications we need them to have or the number of children they can look after, are prohibitive for a number of people who would otherwise quite happily child sit and look after some well, kids for a few hours. And I think that's another thing. Um, is that, you know, if you are fortunate enough to have a network of family or friends around you, you can probably juggle because it's yeah. not just the hours that you're working, it's not just nine to five, it's the wraparound care that grandparents so often do when somebody's sent home from school because they don't feel very well or they've got to be taken to some after school club or something like that. And I think you're absolutely right, Alex. It's about doing a little bit to help because the other thing is that people's circumstances change. You know, people might be okay, they might have got granny helping, both partners, both couple of members of a couple working, it's fine. All of a sudden, granny falls ill, yeah. somebody's made redundant, and everything goes up in the air. And I just think the pressure on people, to, on mortgages and rent and childcare, it's almost impossible. It is. Um, and. Uh, you guys, you are. Uh, you're not mincing your words, you're not mucking around and you're not pulling in any punches. Uh, the sense that I'm getting from you guys at home is if you want kids, firstly, you should pay for them yourselves. And secondly, there's quite a suggestion, actually, that if you want children, the mums shouldn't go to work. Lots oh. of you are saying, why would you? Is this coming from uh, men? Yeah, well, yeah. Mm. And also some women. It's not just the men. Um, Angie's got a radical solution. She's saying... Well, why not, Michelle, if this is all about money? Why don't you pay women to stay at home with their children? It's the best job in the world and it is the most important. That's an interesting Well, uh, I remember a campaign a long time ago called Wages for Housework. We I used to have a family allowance. Yeah. Well, proper, um, proper family allowance. Yeah. There's a story, I think it's a woman in Spain, actually. She's just got a payout from her husband or ex husband That's or whatever right, yeah, I saw that. Backdated pay for all the housework yeah. uh, that she's done over the years. That really made me uh, laugh, that did. But I'm a working mum. Um, I've got a little boy and I love him more than anything in the world. But uh, my uh, identity doesn't start and end just with being somebody's mum. I'm exactly. my own person and I'm my own individual and actually I would suspect that um, I'm a much ra more rounded person for having the balance in my life between work uh, and my home life. But nursery fees, I mean, what, £2,000 a month yeah. I pay, I think, in nursery yeah. fees? It is absolutely yeah. Well, it's, a, it's the same as a mortgage it for is. many, many people, or, or more in some cases. And, of course, the problem is for the childcare providers, they have to know how much they've got coming in, so you can't be flexible and say, oh, can I come in next this Wednesday? Day or that day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Lisa, here we go again. This is just another tax to be squeezed out of all of those people who chose not to have children because they couldn't afford it. Uh, Christine says, this is a ridiculous idea, as usual. Um, I'm not really getting uh, any support there. For I don't think I've seen anyone, quite frankly, that thinks that absolutely everyone should get free Probably, because most of the people who are doing it are putting the kids to bed, helping with the homework or acting as mum and dad taxis. Yes, that might be the case. Uh, you might even be listening, actually, on the radio while you're doing all of the above. If you are, get in touch, tell me your thoughts on your childcare bills. Too much or is it just... Par for the course of being a working parent. Give me your thoughts. I'm uh, going to take a quick break. When I come back, energy. We all know going through the roof, what should be done about it? Nationalisation. Do you reckon? Uh, is that the answer? Can you see this government that seems to be making a hash of a lot of things, quite frankly, uh, making a more successful job of running an energy company? Give me your thoughts. I'll see you in two. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. 
all sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. I campaigned in the largest democratic vote in our island story. I know this country has so much to be proud of. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. The wisdom of the nation is in its people. Vox Populi, Vox Day. That's why I'm joining the People's Channel. Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubry, keeping you company until 7 o'clock tonight alongside me, Joe Phillips and Alex Dean. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I stayed at home for 10 years with my children, Michelle. It was some of the best years of my life, and my kids have gone on to be well-rounded, happy adults. Uh, my life did start and end with my children. There is no need for anyone to have free childcare. You should all live within your means, uh, says one of my viewers. Well, that debate will rumble on for sure. <laughs> but let's move on, shall we? Energy. We all know uh, prices have gone pretty out of hand uh, in some places. What is the answer, though? Uh, lots of talk about price caps and all the rest of it. But get this, uh, the case has been uh, made... I laugh and chuckle a bit because we do go around in circles about this, don't we? But apparently a publicly owned uh, electri uh, electricity generator could save British cos consumers around £21 billion pounds a year. That is about 250 or so quid per household. Uh, Alex Dean, cuts the chase, nationalise energy, is it time for it? No, and it won't happen, and therefore the person this creates the biggest problem for is Keir Starmer, because the gap between his relatively, compared to that, moderate and, and centrist position is on the one hand, an intervention in the market because he wants to create one new company called the, in the tradition of the day, the Great British Power Company or something like that, uh, that will um, draw on renewable energy and offer subsidised um, energy to some households. The gap between his position and the, let's call it, the further left position set out by Common Wealth, what a clever name, um, this, this think tank, will, means that he'll never satisfy the people to the left of him, whereas his desire to intervene in the market means he'll turn off a lot of businesses and, and dissatisfy a lot of people who are involved in commerce. So it, this once again leaves Starmer betwixt and between. Uh, and um, if you really wanted a Labour government, which frankly I imagine Commonwealth does, then you wouldn't set out a position like this, which explicitly criticises the Starmer position, as well as makes it more difficult for him to get his one over the line. Indeed. Well, I've, I've, I have read this completely differently to you, Alex, because I, my understanding from the Commonwealth report is that they are talking about an intervention, not about nationalisation. And Keir Starmer has already ruled that out, um, that they're saying um, that, that this would be about um, a publicly owned clean energy, in other words, reforming it by, by buying out assets uh, such as wind, solar and biomass generators on older contracts and running them on a non-profit 
basis. So I don't think that is completely... Shall I tell you why I think it's... The, maybe the difference between us is uh, when I read that they wanted to do in energy a national programme as profound as the creation of the NHS, which is the comparison they oh, make, okay. that feels to me like a... You know, of course, we had many private hospitals in this country that were folded into the NHS over time after it was started, uh, and that is precisely the kind of parallel they're, they're consciously making. Uh, Doug, one of my viewers has just been in touch saying, Michelle, uh, the point that you've got to focus on here uh, is if the, these kind of things went back into public sector ownership, you know what that would mean? More strikes, the unions being able to create even more strike chaos. Yeah, but we're not talking about renationalising the energy companies. Well, a lot of people would like to. Well, a lot of people might, but I mean that's not, not that's not what is is being proposed here. Um, I mean, at the moment, um, we've got forty percent of the UK's offshore wind generation capacity is publicly owned um, by overseas national entities. So they're actually getting the benefit rather than us. But this is, the government actually tried to get some of these companies who are operating low carbon generators, including nuclear power plants, to switch to contracts for difference. That sounds a bit twee, but it means outsized profits flow back to taxpayers, um, in, but, but then they went instead for the electricity generator levy. But I think this is quite a good idea and it's worth exploring because it would actually stop the arguments about windfall tax because it would actually plough money back into um, investment in this what we need, which is much more green, clean energy, um, so that we can become more self-sufficient. Well, I mean, if government hadn't gone for wind... In the policy environment of, of, the, of the day, if government hadn't announced windfall taxes or levies, I think they would have been severely criticised. So, you know, I think the government did uh, what they thought was... And, of course, the... The companies were also basically openly inviting them to, to uh, take levies uh, on them. It seems to me inevitable that we were going to have, and you know, Tory governments have had windfall taxes in the past. But and when you, you see this kind of profit, even more because there's been no, I don't. Recently, no, I, I, I don't. Higher taxes. I think that the government's getting uh, things about right, not least because the price of, um, of gas is tumbling, mm. and wholesale, I mean, yeah. uh, and the companies that uh, produce uh, energy are not the same companies that then supply it to our homes. And, and so the margins for those some of those companies could be much smaller um, than the margins. And it, it, as one of the reasons some of them have gone out of business, which just significantly disrupts yeah. people's um, Would lives. Would you have higher uh, windfall taxes than currently? I'd like to see more money be ploughed back in to, whether it's through tax or whether it's through a sort of a forced investment. Um, because I, th I think it's ridiculous. Forced investment in what? Well, into something like this, where you're, you're buying up um, old contracts or you're investing in um, existing infrastructure. I mean, what you don't want is big... Most people, I think, who have been struggling this winter to pay their energy bills and are worried about the cost of it, they, they do understand, but they probably can't work out the difference between, as you've just said, Alex, the difference between um, a company that makes an absolute fortune for producing the energy rather than the company that is supplying what's coming out of your cooker or your radiator. Yeah. And that's part of the problem, that there's no linkage and there's no way that you can change it under existing competition rules. Yeah, I do call... All, I find all these calls for extra windfall uh, taxes quite perplexing because some of these uh, organisations on some of their profits, uh, they have rates of about 75%. I mean, what is it you want them to do? What, pay 100%, make no profit at all? Uh, completely de-incentivise any form uh, of investments or business in this country? You give me your thoughts. Lots of you still getting in touch on that childcare situation. Um, and I have to say, I've had about three, four of, the, of similar ones, which is uh, people telling me their stories that they've desperately wanted children, struggled to uh, get children, and found it quite hurtful, actually, that they could potentially be then responsible for paying for the childcare for other children. But oh, do, do they then that. disagree with paying for state education? Well, I was just about to say, I understand it, and my heart goes out to you if you've not managed to conceive if that was your aim and your wish and your goal but at the same time you know society kind of does move on and we do contribute to lots of different things albeit perhaps things that our lives are not directly impacted by tony says michelle i cannot believe uh, that you was just laughing at a guy getting paid uh being made to pay his wife uh, ex-wife money for housework. He was probably busting his bits uh, so that she could stay at home doing the housework. This is just another example of a man getting done over whilst women claim victimhood. Uh, forgive me, Tony, but I, and last time I checked, it wasn't uh, yet illegal or outlawed to find things amusing, and I can't help it. It did. It made me laugh. But it's lovely he's celebrating International Women's Day. 
Well, he's probably uh, still thinks it's International Men's Day, might still be celebrating Well, it is that. for the other 364 days of the year, mainly thanks to people like that and that attitude. Well, that told you, didn't it? Actually, that told... So you've just told Tony, uh, but Care has just asked me to tell you because he's just said... Um, Jo Phillips has just made a stereotypical comment. Can you tell her, please? She's just said, when Granny gets ill. Just for the record, I have just got in from looking after my grandson, who is one year old, so that my daughter and her husband can both go to work. And I am a granddad. He says, I've just done a ten and a half hour day. So there you go. You've told me. No, I ab just told absolutely you agree. And I did say at the beginning that it wasn't just mums, but I was... I stand correct. You did. It is grandparents and aunties and uncles and friends all go. around. It takes a village to raise a child, so it does. I'm going to take a break when I come back. I'm going to have a lot more of your reaction uh, to some of those stories, uh, so don't go anywhere. But I also want to talk to you about Ngozi Falani. Remember her, Marlene Headley, or whatever her name is. She's got a few different names. Uh, there was lots of kind of criticism and all the rest of it about the goings-on, uh, where she... Uh, get this, because it is really offensive. She was asked, everyone, are you ready? Where are you from? I know, I know, I know. You might need to be seated to receive that, but that's what she was asked and it caused an outrage. We'll have that, because uh, it hasn't gone away and it didn't end there. There'll be more on that in just two minutes. Don't go anywhere. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go. And it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hi, Andrew Pearce here. Join me every Friday lunchtime for a proper no-nonsense debrief of the week's events. The special guests in the studio and the GB News team on the ground, I'll be getting you up to date with news, some intelligent discussion, and my own sharp take. The weekend starts here with me every Friday lunchtime on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even some ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank. Fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News.
Hello there, I'm Michelle Dubry and I'm keeping you company right through till 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me, the political commentator Joe Phillips and the political consultant Alex Dean. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I still haven't actually managed to find anyone who thinks that absolutely everyone should get absolutely all of their childcare for free. If you're out there, you do exist. Tell me. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts. Um, divided opinions on whether or not... Um, the government should be more involved or less when it comes to provision of energy. Uh, really divided you are tonight. Um, yes, 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 says Nigel. Uh, it should be in public ownership. I mean, but what about the points that people were making? Because I think what you're talking about is basically like nationalising the whole thing. Um, you know, governments these days, they don't have much of a strong track record, do they? So I think giving them more responsibility for essential services uh, perhaps would ring alarm bells, certainly for me. Anyway, uh, right, Ngozi Falani, uh, Marlene Headley, whatever it is uh, that you refer to this lady as. Remember her? Uh, she was the person that got, uh, she put a complaint in, didn't she? She was invited to uh, an, an event uh, and then made a complaint because get this, everyone, trigger warning. Uh, so if you're easily offended, uh, press mute now. But guess what? She was asked, and it is offensive, I do warn you, she was asked where she was from. <sighs> I think I can carry on. Right. She was asked where she was from and then it proceeded. Where is she really from? And I think we all know the story, don't we? She said the name of the organisation. Uh, then she said which kind of place, town, and it went on and on. There was a huge outcry. She then went into Buckingham Palace. She had a sit-down with the uh, lady-in-waiting in question. Uh, there was a nice little photo shoot. There was a statement issue. On you go. But no. Uh, and Gersey has been back in the press today saying that she's been absolutely abused, all the rest of it, to such a point she's having to temporarily uh, step back as the CEO of the charity. And she's not happy with the apology she received. Well, it's pretty convenient that this has all happened because I saw a number of um, allegations about Sister Space's uh, financial arrangements Indeed. last year. So this, this has all emerged at a very good time if you uh, were facing those things. The best thing to have happen, the best thing to be able to do is to have a race row that means that the people won't focus on the things that they were previously talking about uh, your organisation. Uh, I can't remember if it was Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson who said, it's hard for my opponent to hit me if my fist's in his face. Uh, and um, on the, so she's really gone on the front foot and whether it's um, you know just a representative of the state who was the convenient person to to serve as the patsy in this or, or whether specifically having the Buckingham Palace imprimatur was so useful there's no um, doubt in my mind that it, it, this this lady in waiting was a highly useful person at just the right time mm. indeed Joe. well I'm not entirely sure what she's asking for because at the time, Lady Susan Hussey, who is in her 80s and who'd worked for the Royal Household for many, many years, who probably should not have pushed it, and, you know, it is one of the, the rules of good breeding that actually the last thing you do is to embarrass somebody. And I think certainly touching somebody's hair and moving it to look at their name badge, which is alleged, is silly. But, there were, you know, she left immediately. There was a fulsome apology at the time. There was a meeting between the two of them, where a joint statement was agreed yeah. um, and that it had been filled with warmth and understanding and that she had... and uh, Ms Fulani had accepted Lady Susan's apology. So what... I'm not entirely sure why she's bringing it well, up I, right I, I've now got, uh, I've got a few, to ask now. I've got a few suspicions as to why... Well, you, you, want to keep this, you want to keep the story alive, don't you? But if you recall at the time that this broke, the transcript of their conversation was, was like a court transcript. It was so specific and precise. One wonders if it was recorded. It was all on. And you say, by the way, that when you've got good breeding, you're taught not to embarrass people. This whole thing don't wash with me um, because uh, Ngozi Filani turned up to an event uh, and nothing wrong with this, fair enough. She was very proud of her heritage, very proud of her uh, cultural origins, whatever the word is. She visually made herself stand out in a nod to her heritage. And if you make yourself visually stand out and then someone comes over to you, literally whose job it is to ascertain who people are in the room so they can feed that information, back so that you get a nice warm welcome yes. and you cannot be surprised when that she person was in full, asks you she was about in full your tribal, she was in yes. full tribal dress imagine if a Scotsman had gone to a reception in, in, uh, in Africa wearing a kilt uh, and quite naturally someone, and who, someone who didn't recognise it would say where are you from? And by the way, if it's such an yes, awful thing... Yes, but if you thing, get a pushback, if, you, you know, if for whatever reason... And none of oh, us, she should have known better, I agree. None of us was there. A pushback if, or someone just being a bit... Well, what? whatever. I think, you know, Lady Susan Hussey apparently 
carried on asking the questions, but as I say, none of us were there. I just think it's it, it's bonkers. Well, it doesn't wash with me, that's for sure. No, it didn't at the time, it certainly doesn't does now. If asking about your heritage is so insulting and offending, why, on her own website, by the way, uh, on the, she has four lines on her About Us page, every single one referenced heritage, because obviously you will remember that hair charity only exclusively supports people from an African and Caribbean heritage. Hmm, I'll leave you to ponder that. That is all we've got time for. Alex, thank, Adjur, you, thank you for your wonderful company. Thank you for you at home. Uh, you leave as you've been going on telling me that if you don't, uh, if you want kids, you've got to pay for them yourself. That's my takeaway from tonight's show. Have a good one. Uh, enjoy your evening and I'll be back tomorrow and I shall see you then. Hello again, it's Aidan McGiven here from the Met Office. There'll be further snow in places during the next 24 hours, but the emphasis for snow shifts a bit further north as milder air returns to the far south associated with these weather fronts. And the cold air hangs on across the rest of the UK as the weather fronts bring rain to the far south. The northern edge of them will result in snow, mainly on Wednesday evening. It's parts of Wales, especially over higher parts, as well as the Midlands, where we're likely to see those spells of snow bring perhaps some disruption, five, possibly 10 centimetres in places. That peters out by the end of the night and it stays dry with clear spells for Scotland, Northern Ireland, Northern England, with temperatures well below freezing in places. A few snow flurries for the north of Scotland, otherwise mostly fine as we go into Thursday. Showers of rain in the far south of England and South Wales with temperatures here above freezing as we begin the day. Gusty wind though continuing. In between for Northern Ireland, North Wales, the North Midlands and Northern England, here we're going to see an increasingly wintry scene during Thursday. Rain at the very lowest levels and around coasts, but above 100 metres, the potential for disruptive snow, especially from the Peak District north into the North Pennines. That's where it's possible we'll see 10 to 20 centimetres for even populated places like Leeds, Bradford, Sheffield, Wakefield, and for some of the most exposed spots, 20 to 40 centimetres of snow. Some significant disruption then for Trans-Pennine routes, and that continues into Friday morning. That's why there's an amber warning for this part of Northern England and the North Midlands. Otherwise, on Friday, we'll see those spells of snow tend to drift further south, perhaps returning some snowfall to Mid Wales, the Midlands and East Anglia for a time on Friday morning. Eventually, it peters out. Drier conditions return from the north and the northwest with some sunshine, but it stays cold. And it will be cold as we start off Saturday fairly widely. Another band of rain moves in with some snow again over northern hills. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 
GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it today! Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Good evening. I'm Lawrence Fox, standing in for Nigel Farage this evening. On the programme tonight, boy, do I have an Ofcom compliant show for you. Three times back and forth from the lawyers. Should treason laws be updated? We'll debate that. Meanwhile, it's International Women's Day, but this is, uh, is this momentous day more important and needed than ever? And the latest on Matt Hancock's leaky WhatsApp messages. First, though, let's bring you up to speed with what's going on in the world. It's the news with Polly Middlehurst. Lawrence, thank you. Good evening. The Prime Minister has accused the Labour leader of being on the side of the people smugglers as the pair went head-to-head -head in the House of Commons today over the new illegal migration bill. Rishi Sunak defended the legislation, which will remove those who enter the UK illegally and ban them from seeking asylum in future. But Sir Keir Starmer cast doubt on the plan, saying attempts to tackle the number of channel crossings in the last decade have failed and numbers have actually gone up. The Honourable Gentleman has been on the wrong side of this issue his entire career. He, descri he described all immigration law as racist. He said it was a mistake to control immigration. And he has never, ever voted for tougher asylum laws. It is clear, Mr Speaker, while he's in hock to the open border activists, we're on the side of the British people. Mr Speaker, when I was in charge of prosecutions, I extradited countless rapists and, and the, convi the conviction rate for people smuggling was twice what it is today. I voted against his legislation last time because I said it wouldn't work. Since it became law, the numbers have gone up. He's proved me right. Well, in other news today, the reward for information about the shooting of a police officer in Northern Ireland last month has been increased to £150,000. Detective Chief Inspector John Caldwell was shot up to ten times at a sports centre in Omer after coaching his children's football match. He remains in a critical but stable condition in hospital. RMT union members will vote tomorrow on a new pay offer from Network Rail aimed at resolving a long-running dispute over pay, jobs and conditions. The suspended industrial action was due to take place on the 16th and 17th of March. The union says the new pay offer involves extra money, but they say industrial action with 14 other rail companies will still go ahead later on this month. And finally, dozens of flights have been disrupted in the south of England as snow continues to fall across the country tonight. That's after the coldest night of the year so far last night. The Met Office saying temperatures dropped to minus 15.4 degrees in the Scottish Highlands. That's the lowest March temperature in more than a decade. And what's on the way? Well, more sleet, snow and sub-zero temperatures expected right across the UK until at least Friday. That's all from me. I'm back in an hour. Now back to Lawrence Fox. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the definition of a traitor 
is a person who betrays the trust of another, a cause, etc. A person who commits or is judged to be guilty of treason against his or her sovereign or country. All of us will remember the devastatingly sad images of Her Late Majesty the Queen sat, racked and crouched in fragile grief, needlessly muzzled and so alone on the pews of St George's Chapel, Windsor, without so much as a hand to comfort her following the loss 